Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I hope I'm not in between your lunch. So actually today, uh, my presentation is basically trying to put it okay. Here it is. Financial inclusion. Since to, to yesterday as well as today morning, we have been talking about the financial inclusion. I just wanted to give a different perspective where I come from. I work with Gulf African Bank. It's a 100% Sharia compliant bank. We wanted to give a perspective to all of us here, the financial inclusion and what is what we are doing as a Sharia compliant bank in Kenya. Before starting this presentation, uh, I have some statistic. Actually, it was released uh, last month. It is a global FINDEX uh, report, which says like Kenya is among the top five countries who are progressing so fastly in digital finance in the last 10 years. And that's amazing story, right? And 79% of the Kenyan adults are having accounts in the form of like a bank or financial institution, SACOs, microfinance, or even with the mobile service provider. So that sounds amazing, like 79%, that's quite huge. But again, there are, despite of this high rate of uh, financial inclusion, uh, there is a section which we present actually, uh, where we found there is a, a large number of untapped customer, and that is the area we play. As per the Economist Intelligence Unit report, the Islamic banking only addressed to 2% Kenyan of the total banking asset. And though, if you're surprised, the total Muslim population in Kenya is around 5 to 5.2 million, which is almost 11% of the total population. And these are the largely untapped market uh, where, where they have a different belief in terms of Sharia compliance. And this is where our bank and our team are working together to innovate, innovate different products to cover and bank this population and provide the solution so they cannot be left behind. Let me give you some perspective about, uh, okay, we already discussed about financial inclusion since yesterday, so I don't want to repeat it. But in, in terms of the Islamic finance, it is basically, it follows a different uh, Sharia law, which basically prohibited the interest rate. Uh, you know, there are some restricted area of industries or businesses, they don't do it. Uh, that include the gambling, uh, some meat product like pork, they don't do it. They don't promote pornography or alcoholic beverages. So that is the only differences where you find between the conventional banking and the Islamic banking. Uh, there has always been a myth where you, when you talk about Islamic banking, people think of like it's only for the Muslims. It's not for open for, you know, non-Muslim community, but that is the wrong thing. There is a Sharia law, there is every banking, whether it is a conventional banking or Islamic banking, they follow particular set of standard and processes. And this is where Islamic banking also come into picture, where they follow Sharia law. In Sharia, of course, the interest is uh, prohibited. And that is where the conventional banking who is providing the services, uh, different pro banking services, and they put interest or charges, whether you're lending or, you know, when you're doing uh, different kind of financing or capital financing for your businesses, uh, that treated as a prohibition as per uh, Sharia law. And that's where the Muslim population refrain from doing the conventional banking to an extent. Uh, so this is where we come into picture. Uh, but just to give you an example how it is a different uh, between the conventional banking and the Islamic banking, Everybody would have gone to KFC, right? KFC in Kenya or Middle East or in anywhere if in the Muslim country, even if you find KFC, and you'll find like there is a halal, you know, meat product. And the same, but when you consume it, it is same. The chicken in Saudi Arabia or chicken in Kenya is same, right? The taste is same, but it is called halal. The other, other thing is not called halal. You know, the difference only is the end product is same in both the cases. The only difference, what it comes is the processes which runs behind uh, the whole ecosystem. In halal, how the slaughter is happening, 
What are the processes as per the Sharia they are following to slaughter the meat? But the end product, what do you get it? It is more or less the same thing. So that is the kind of a difference in terms of when we design a product for Islamic banking, that is where we follow the Islamic processes. But the end game is the same thing. We are also keeping the customer at the center. We are creating a product which is trying to serve the customer need, meet the customer need. So that is how it is. So ultimately, if you are a Muslim or non-Muslim, when you are coming to any Islamic bank or Islamic uh, service provider, that is the need they need to meet. Let me tell you the financial aspect of it, how it is growing and what globally it looks like. You'll be surprised, 2.88 trillion US dollar asset globally. That is huge. It's present in 80 countries and growing 10 to 15 percent. And even during the COVID pandemic, the growth was huge. In fact, it is expected that it will grow beyond 3.64 trillion dollars in by 2024. Recently, even if you see the many uh, developed country, whether it is UK, Australia, uh, the regulator, especially, they started, you know, getting the traction to make some amendment in their regulation to support Islamic banking. Like uh, two weeks back, if you see uh, last month, in fact, Australia has granted a license, banking license to Islamic bank in Australia. So, and again, UK also, they have given, a, they have changed their regulations to support it. So there are a lot of traction coming out in, the, in terms of the Islamic banking. Uh, so just moving from there, even in Kenya, the CBK, our CBK in Kenya, they also started finding the benefits of Islamic finance and that is the reason they also amended the regulations to support the Islamic financing and Islamic banking in Kenya. That was started in 2006. And since 2006, if you see, we have quite a presence of Islamic banking in Kenya. Uh, if you see the top three banks, uh, who is 100% Sharia compliant bank, like Gulf African, where I represent, First Community Bank, DIB Bank Kenya. And there are some big tier one banks also. They have started opening their window, Islamic window, uh, that like APSA, KCB, National Bank, Stima. Stima, in fact, they started this year itself. So they also value uh, the benefits or the customer who are unbanked and they want to cover it through uh, Islamic window as well. Apart from that, you, you can see all the names here. Lastly, I think I will uh, talk about what we are doing in terms of promoting and supporting the Islamic uh, banking or Islamic financing in Kenya. So as a, just a brief about Gulf Africa, we are also highly regulated. We are regulated by CBK, uh, CBK Kenya. We are of course 100% Sharia compliant with 0.8% of market share. We are operational since 2008. Since then, we were able to capture 100,000, over, over 100,000 customer in Kenya. We are present across uh, Kenya. We are majorly in Nairobi and Mombasa coastal region. And we have, we are also like a conventional banking. We also provide different digital services, whether you talk about mobile banking, internet banking, or onboarding channels. We have CDMs, ATM across. Uh, so th that is like in terms of digitalization of the services, we are also providing the same. In terms of the innovation, in terms of helping uh, the section or providing different innovative product, as per Sharia law or Islamic finance. We recently actually launched uh, uh, Halal Pesa in March this year. This is basically Halal Pesa is a, is a mobile financing and we partnered with M-Pesa Safaricom of course. And uh, this was the first kind of a Sharia compliant lending or financing product in entire Africa. And I will amaze you that since it was launched in the first 100 days, we were able to subscribe over a million customer on that platform. And we were able to disperse over 250 million shilling as well on that platform. So that, that defines that there is a need of Islamic products in, in, in the market. And we need to also look at how we can 
innovate our fintech solutions to cater that particular market as well. Apart from that, even if we, we, we launch a credit card as well, which is also as per Sharia, it's a BNPL product as well. Uh, since we don't charge interest, so there is a, there is a Sharia compliant aspect of, uh, on, the, on the credit card that we call it as a GAP aval. This is a, even, this is one kind in East Africa. We partnered with Visa for that. Actually, we have started, when I'm saying partnering with M-Pesa, Safaricom, we are partnering with Visa just to explore and partner, collaborate, or co-create different products. In fact, if we talk about different financial services, we are exploring partnership and collaboration with different fintech in Kenya. In fact, the area what we are looking at is even the supply chain financing, whether we can have a vendor who can customize the product to meet the Sharia compliance as well, so we can meet the need of our customer. Similarly, there is a lot of embedded financing what we do. We partnered with non-financial institutions where we are also providing uh, banking services. Or for example, let's say we, we, we are providing like KRA services, we, you know, the payments, remittances services to those uh, third party non-financial institutions. So we, the whole idea to present today is, is not to talk about the FinTech aspect of it. What I was trying to give a perspective is we, there is an area for when we talk about financial inclusion. Financial inclusion is to address, to allow in every individual has to have an accessibility to financial product, not based on the religion or not based on the faith, but in any point of, uh, point of time, if they want to have a financial services, they need to have. And this is where our bank is committed to, and we are providing and partnering with different finances. Uh, financial institutions as well as the fintechs to provide such kind of uh, services to the customer. But of course, as the myth is, it is only related to Islamic or Muslim. It's not the right, uh, I mean, right uh, feeling about that because even myself, if you think, I'm a Hindu working for a Muslim bank, but I'm working because of the belief because I know there is a taboo behind it and that's what we wanted to break it. So whenever we talk to financial institution and we talk about how you're doing the trade, like let's say for example, Halal Pesa, it's a simple mobile lending product, right? But how it works, if I tell you about it, this is basically, it's, it's, there is a trade, like in conventional mobile lending product, what you do is when somebody goes to your platform, you're, you'll be credit, you're, you'll be scored against your profile then you'll be putting a 13% or 12%, whatever interest rate, and you'll be given the money on top of it. And that's the whole process. But on, on the Sharia part, since it is uh, following the Sharia law, law, uh, law and regulations, what happened is whenever you're requesting for a loan, since it is an ethical way of uh, financing, we believe in partnership or trading. There is a way how we make money. There is a, there is a four aspect where we make money. And this is where whenever you ask for our financing, we do a trade on behalf of the same money. And there is a somewhere in Bushra right now with Halal Pesa. It is a, what we do is for every trade, we do a trade in Bushra market, which is in Malaysia. We buy commodity and then we sell it to you. And one thing, amazing thing about this one is we are only charging 5% on this one. And that is because of the services, what is uh, M-Pesa is providing as well as what is uh, done on the trading side of it. So that is that is whole process I wanted to break. Uh, I hope that is, that is more than enough for today. If any question, uh, I'll be more than welcome to answer that. Thank you. Uh, I'll be more than welcome to answer that. Thank you.